Today I'll discuss the management of head injury and uh, I'll start it now. Okay, uh, head injury uh, is any injury that is uh, to the region of the head and uh, uh, skull. And it could be some minor injury, like uh, it could be some minor trauma, um, laceration or abrasion, or it could be a loss of consciousness or, uh, or to some extent that it could cause focal neurological defici uh, deficit. So it could be any injury to the uh, area of the head and, uh, head and skull. <coughs> With the head injuries, usually uh, we have uh, traumatic brain injuries. Traumatic brain injury is a non-degenerative, non-congenital insult. It is a trauma. So it is not a degenerative problem. It is not a congenital insult. It is a direct external mechanical insult to the brain that can lead to permanent or temporary impairment of the functions of the brain. That could be the cognitive function, physical function, or the psychosocial function. Any uh, uh, deficit in any of these function is called uh, brain injury, second to trauma or traumatic brain injury. And we usually uh, use this term TBI for it. And uh, it could be or could not be associated with the loss of consciousness. It logically, uh, the most common cause of uh, brain injury or uh, trauma to the brain is motor vehicle accidents. That's the most common uh, cause of it. Then falls, especially in elderly, assaults, uh, sports related injuries or firearm related injuries. These are the uh, TBI, the causes of the TBI. Okay. Uh, highest among the adolescents, uh, young adults, and those older than 75. In, usually in the older patients, we have patients presenting to us with falls and uh, head injuries secondary to falls. 50% of major trauma deaths are because of this traumatic brain injury, and uh, vehicle crashes are the most leading cause of it. Second leading cause is falls, which is more common in the elderly people. Uh, motor vehicle crashes uh, cause this uh, head injuries about 44, uh, 44 uh, and they, they are common in 44 percent of the population that presents in the accident and emergency uh, uh, unit. Uh, 26 percent present with fall and uh, uh, others are less than that. Okay. Uh, why it is important to discuss it is because uh, it has a high potential for poor outcome. And uh, usually, and, uh, we'll discuss in it in more detail. Uh, what are the uh, the three uh, uh, different uh, peaks of deaths? So that's usually occur at three points in time after injury. Some patients they are uh, um, uh, they they have such life threatening injuries that they immediately die at the spot. So and they are called uh, they they are uh, called at the spot death. Some are. Uh, having injuries that may cause death within two hours and some have injuries that may have a delayed uh, uh, mortality. So the mortality can be immediate, it can be urgent within two hours, or it could be um, delayed after three uh, weeks or within three weeks of uh, the injury. Okay, uh, this review the anatomy of the scalp and uh, uh, outer covering of the uh, head. What is a scalp? What is scalp? Any idea what is a scalp? Level 12, do you know what is a scalp? We use this term very often. Cranium. Cranium? Scalp in... Um, the, what is the uh, exact uh, the, what is the exact uh, thing that we say that this is the scalp or the lien to the scalp that is a skull cranium is skull i'm asking about scalp what is a scalp Scalp is the covering that is outside the bone. It includes the skin, 
it includes the subcutaneous tissue and it includes uh, all the uh, layers that are in between or uh, that are beneath it till your periosteum or the bone. So that hole is called the scalp. And if you remember from your background knowledge of anatomy that there are five layers of scalp. I'm not going into the detail of it. Just keep this thing in mind that it is highly vascular and there are very little subcutaneous tissue. So what is the uh, problem that even a minor laceration of the scalp bleeds a lot? Sometimes patients presents to you with uh, their clothes full of blood and there are a lot of... Uh, 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 hue and cry in the family that uh, it has got a problem. But what is the actual problem? There is a small laceration in the scalp that uh, because of the uh, psychological uh, 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 fear, uh, worry of, or the fear of the blood, they don't uh, press it and uh, they present uh, in the emergency with uh, blood trickling from there. So why is it so? Because it is highly vascular and there is no more, uh, not more supportive tissue to control that bleeding. So just a minor laceration, a very minor laceration sometimes bleeds a lot. So you have to be very careful. If uh, you come across a patient who has a laceration of the uh, scalp region, try to compress it. Compress it for about 10 to uh, five to 10 minutes it will uh, solve a lot of uh, problem there. So you have to be uh, aware about this bleeding issue. So we have uh, different layers of um, uh, and this uh, uh, scalp that is covering the uh, periosteum or the cranium. We have skin, we have the periosteum and underneath is the bone. Uh, then when we go beneath, then we have the coverings that are over the brain. Periosteum is covering the bone and then uh, underneath the bone, when we are seeing the inside thing, the brain is covered by multiple layers. What are the layers that are covering the brain? There are the three uh, meninges or the three layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Uh, these are the three uh, membranes that cover it. What is the dura? Dura is the outermost layer that is lining the periosteum that is lining the bone. Then there is arachnoid matter, which is between the dura and uh, the pia mater. And this is full of blood. It contains a lot of blood vessels and all the uh, major veins, they also uh, travel in this <coughs> layer. Then we have uh, pia mater that covers the brain. So we have pia mater, arachnoid matter, and the dura mater. So this is a pad that covers the brain from inside out. We have pia, arachnoid, and the dura mater. Okay. <coughs> uh, the types of head injuries that usually come across, they are uh, simple lacerations. Um, they could be scalp fracture or uh, the trauma can be a minor head trauma or it could be a major head trauma involving the brain deficits. Lacerations are easily recognized. They are the most minor type of head trauma. And uh, why it is important uh, because uh, uh, as I, I have already told you that scalp is highly vascular and there is no supportive tissue to uh, control uh, the bleeding once it starts or the vessel starts bleeding. So there is profuse bleeding usually and a major complication here is infection after uh, the lacerations. If you don't take care, uh, these, uh, very, these are very prone to develop infections. Now, skull fractures. Skull fractures can be linear. Um, just a line that is a break in the continuity of the bone without any alteration of the relationship of the parts. There is no uh, any breakage or any slippage. So just a linear break that is in the continuity of the bone. And usually these are the low velocity injuries. It's not a uh, 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 high velocity trauma. Sometimes there are depressed fracture which is because of the inward indentation of the skull. That's just like we are seeing in this picture, there is a indentation, there is a inward depression that is present on the skull. And usually these are the result of powerful blows and powerful traumas. So the fractures can be uh, linear or they can be uh, depressed. Sometimes uh, if there is a high velocity trauma in uh, road traffic accidents or in major blast injuries, you may have commutative fractures. There are multiple fractures. You, have, you will read these terms in orthopedics. Uh, so uh, the, uh, these are uh, very common terms. Maybe you have read it already. 
So there will be multiple community days when there are multiple fractures and there are multiple fragments. So sometimes uh, and this uh, trauma is of so much high velocity that brain is, uh, sorry, the bone is uh, fragmented into different pieces. And compound is if there is a depressed fracture, if there is a, a scalp uh, community fracture, and there is an in internal injury also. There is a communicating intracranial cavity injury. So uh, it could be a compound fracture. We call it a compound fracture. Okay, so th this you can see is the uh, community fracture, and there are multiple segments. Uh, this picture is not big. Okay, this is a uh, this is a community fracture. If you can see, sorry, this is not a community. This is a community fracture, and you can see there are multiple segments, and they may be associated with compound injury. This is a linear fracture, and you can see that it uh, the different uh, fragments are not separate. It is a linear injury. It is a linear fracture, but there is no depression here as uh, as seen. Here you can see the depression. Uh, can you see my cursor? Can you see the pointer? Can you see the pointer? Yes, doctor, yes, we can see it. Okay. So, so here you can see this is a depressed structure. And these multiple fragments, this is an exam, uh, example of a community fracture. And this community fracture is may or may not be associated with intracranial injury. So it is a compound fracture because of the depression, the internal bone movement causes injury to the brain. So there may be, uh, may or may not be a compound fracture. Okay, uh, we classify the injuries according to the location. We classify uh, injury or these fractures according to the location. Uh, what is the site of the injury of the skull? Uh, we can give the name according to it. There could be frontal injuries or frontal fractures, temporal fractures involving the temporal bones, parietal fractures involving the parietal bone. And uh, there could be posterior fossa or the occipital area fracture or orbital fracture that is around the eye or basilar skull fracture. Why it is important to know these because the different brain areas, they are uh, controlling different parts of the body. So uh, identifying what area is damaged, you can identify uh, what, what could be the neurological deficit in this patient and you have to be uh, aware of, uh, or you, uh, while examining, you are aware of that these things can happen to the patient and you specifically look for those neurological deficits. Now, uh, one by one we'll see them. Uh, the temporal bone fracture, uh, Usually there is uh, the temporalis muscle uh, there. So the boggy uh, temporal muscles, uh, it uh, becomes boggy because there is uh, uh, laceration or there is injury to the vessels and there is uh, blood collection uh, all around that. And it's uh, typical presentation is battle sign. Uh, the ear is bruised. If you see the area around the ear, on the area behind the ear or at the region of the mastoid region, it is bruised and uh, this is called the battle sign. Uh, another presentation is otoria. What is otoria? Any idea what is otoria? Uh, this chart uh, from uh, there from the ear because it is affecting uh, uh, the, the uh, temporal bone. So it causes a torio also. There is discharge from the ear. This discharge can be simple serous discharge or if there is vascular injury, it can cause bloody discharge or blood discharge from the, uh, from the ear. Then parietal bone uh, fractures, they usually present with deafness uh, because of the involvement of the, uh, uh, the uh, cranial nerve to the uh, ear. See, CSF otoria, again, the CSF starts coming out of the uh, ear and there is bulging of the tympanic membrane by blood or CSF. The tympanic membrane itself, when you are doing the uh, tympan, uh, you are doing the, otos uh, uh, you are, uh, doing the otoscopy, you can see the tympanic membrane uh, bulging out and there can be facial paralysis. The parietal and uh, temporal uh, lobes or the, uh, the temporal bones, they are one over the other. So usually the injuries, they are 
combined. Sometimes the patient presents with you and combined involvement of the parietal and the, uh, temporal bones. Orbital fracture usually present as raccoon eyes. Uh, uh, both the, uh, uh, or, uh, the uh, upper eyelids and the lower eyelids, they are uh, reddened and uh, there is a chymosis or uh, there is a redness or a bluish discoloration around it because of the extravasation of the blood. We call it periorbital chymosis or the raccoon eyes and there may be associated or uh, optic nerve injury. Then uh, the base of the skull fracture, it usually presents as atoria or rhinoria. Rhinoria is uh, CSF leakage through the nose, serious discharge, discharge of the CSF through the nose. And there may be when you uh, do the uh, otoscopy, there may be the tympanic membrane bulging. Uh, you may have battle sign because all these bones are connected. You may have uh, facial paralysis because of the, uh, cranial, uh, the facial nerve damage. And sometimes patient may present you with retinitis over tiger. Okay. Uh, how to identify the thing that is coming out is CSF or not? Uh, we can uh, do some test uh, to check it out. Uh, first is uh, whatever is coming out, uh, the fluid that is discharging from the ear or the nose. We can uh, check it for glucose. If it is uh, high in glucose uh, as compared to the blood, it is uh, taken as, uh, as CSF. If there is blood in this fluid, uh, you can uh, think about it. It, 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 is, uh, uh, it can be anything because the test is not reliable. And then if the blood is mixed, because blood is, uh, you can uh, mix, uh, the, the blood also contain glucose. So if you are checking the glucose and the blood is mixed in it, you cannot be uh, clarified. So if it is clear fluid, just check for glucose. Uh, your idea is clear that this is CSF. Uh, if it is very high then as compared to the uh, as compared to the blood, but if it is mixed with blood, then uh, we cannot say it for sure that this is uh, CSF. So we can go for the other method. The other method is take a drop of it, uh, whatever uh, that thing is coming out. If it is blood or if it is uh, clear fluid, uh, take it on a white towel. And if you observe it for a period of time, within a few minutes, you will see that blood is in the center and a yellow ring appears around it. This is called a hello ring sign. So uh, uh, these two uh, methods can tell you that the fluid that is coming out of the ear or the nose, it is CSF. It is leaking through it. Okay, uh, then uh, minor head trauma can be in form of concussion. A sudden transient mechanical head injury with disruption of the neuro, uh, neuro, uh, neurological activity, neuronal activity, and uh, there is loss of consciousness or a change in uh, uh, level of the consciousness. It occurs when the brain suddenly shifts inside the skull and knocks against the skull bony surface. It's called a coup injury. C O U P, coup injury. What is coup injury? That person hits a wall and there is a direct injury at the site of the impact and we call it a coup injury now can anyone tell me what is a counter coup injury this all is you have already studied in your anatomy as well as in your physiology so uh, uh, you should know this that's why uh, i'm not going into the detail of it what is the counter coup injury any anyone knows uh, anyone ever heard about counter coup or coup injury and counter coup injury Okay, uh, okay, we'll uh, discuss as we go on. The first thing is <coughs> concussion injuries. When brain suddenly, when the uh, skull suddenly hits inside uh, to some object, the brain inside is also get affected and this is a direct injury to that area. This is called the direct or a coup injury, C-O-U-P, coup injury. And the typical signs are there may be a brief uh, disruption of the loss of consciousness and uh, this could be uh, um, extended. Um, the patient may get uh, in unconscious state for long. So uh, usually, uh, uh, usually it is just few, uh, but uh, sometimes it can be prolonged depending on, on the extent of the injury. So uh, concussion uh, injuries uh, um, 
associated with amnesia. If you ask the patient uh, how it happened, he will be uh, not having any memory of it. He has no memory why, why um, he's having the pain here and what had happened. He cannot tell the exact event how it happened. So it, there is amnesia about that event and patient may complain of headache. If the, uh, sorry, uh, this loss of consciousness is in concussion for brief consciousness is in con concussion and contusion, there is a massive consciousness, not a, a prolonged uh, loss of consciousness it, because there is internal uh, hematomas developing that may extend the uh, loss of consciousness state. Uh, sorry, I mixed the two things. Concussion is a brief pause of consciousness and uh, when uh, the things are becoming great or bigger, the loss of consciousness is affected accordingly. Contusion is bruising of the brain tissue within a focal area. Just like contusion uh, we have on the skin contusions, just like that, the same thing is in the brain. It is a localized area of bruising and it is in closed head injury. The head is not fractured, only the internal uh, area is, uh, or internal brain is damaged because of a direct impact. Okay, now look at this picture of the brain. If you see this, uh, when there is a direct, okay, when there is a direct uh, impact here, the brain in this area is affected. This is called a coup injury. But what is uh, uh, brain in actual? Brain is an organ that is suspended in this lake of CSF. So what happened when there is a sudden uh, impact because of the inertia, the brain is pushed towards uh, the other side and the back of that area is also get affected. This is called a counter coup injury. So patient will have injury at the site of impact as well as injury on the other side of the brain, the sites that is remote from the site of impact. So uh, this is called a, a coup, counter coup injury. The injury at the site of impact and the injury on the opposite side. It is clear now what is coup and what is counter coup? Is it clear what is coup and the counter coup? The direct impact injury is the coup injury. And there is another area of damage on the opposite side that is away from the injury. We call it counter coup injury, but usually these injuries, uh, they are of major head trauma. The patient uh, usually uh, is involved in a road traffic accident or some blast injury or some uh, high velocity trauma or high uh, um, fall, fall from a very big height and they can have this coup and the counter coup injuries. Minor trauma usually don't uh, lead to, uh, don't uh, uh, lead to the, these sort of injuries. Okay, laceration, we have already discussed laceration is tearing of the brain tissue. And uh, these brain lacerations, they are uh, associated with depressed structure usually but they can be with the uh, uh, open fractures and penetrating injuries. Uh, because uh, With the open fractures and penetrating injuries, the uh, things are usually massive. So uh, lacerations are, uh, lacerations are just superficial tearing or uh, some tearing. So more associated with uh, depressed, but it can be with the open fracture or penetrating injuries. Intracranial hemorrhage is commonly associated with it. Uh, patients usually have a hemorrhage inside the brain matter and that if excessive, that can cause space occupying lesion and other problems in the brain. Okay, complications uh, of uh, these injuries can be intracranial hemorrhages, which could be extra axial or it could be intra axial. Extra axial means outside the brain matter. Intra axial means inside the brain matter. So extra axial, we have epidural, subdural or the subarachnoid hemorrhages. And intra-axial or intracranial, we have um, as such intra, uh, into the brain matter, we have intraparenchymal hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage. Now, um, look at this picture. You can see that there are different uh, uh, areas of bleeding are shown here. If you see the uh, presentation here, this uh, um, is the um, periosteum of the bone. 
and dura mater is very firmly attached to it so when there is an epidural hemorrhage a hemorrhage between the periosteum and the dura the picture of this uh, uh what you can say um hemorrhage is different from the picture that is of the subdural hemorrhage this is uh, the subdural hemorrhage as it is inside the um uh between the dura and the arachnoid matter or we can say below the dura matter so it is spindle shape just like a spindle but epidural they are more like a crescent the picture is not very clear here next uh, in the other pictures it will be more clear to you but the difference between the epidural and the subdural hematoma is one is crescent shape just like hilal it is like the shape of a hilal and the other is spindle shape like a uh, biconvex lens just like a biconvex lens uh, or you can say the shape of uh, uh, the lenses that are uh, in the glasses it is like that a biconvex lens appearance okay uh, now one by one we'll go into the detail of it epidural hemorrhage it is a neurological emergency what happened that because of the uh, massive injury because of the trauma there is bleeding between the dura and the inner surface of the skull and uh, it uh, commonly there is bleeding uh, by the arterial origin so it bleeds uh, the bleeding is more uh, this is bleeding to the medial meningeal artery or uh, it could sometimes it could be venous because of the damage to the dural venous sinuses but usually it is arterial in origin what are its clinical manifestations what are its clinical manifestations uh, patient has a typical presentation if you take the history from the patient there is a typical presentation that uh, after the trauma patient is initially unconscious but then has uh, then he gets up and he becomes sane or he uh, he has a uh, uh, normal uh, brain activity or a normal consciousness level and then it is again followed by a decrease in loss of consciousness we call it a lucid interval uh, patient is unconscious at the, maybe at the time of the injury patient becomes unconscious but then he regains his consciousness and then again as the pressure is building up patient becomes uh, unconscious again so there is a lucid interval of consciousness between the two phases of unconsciousness and why there is another uh, uh, why there is this lucid interval because initially the first un unconsciousness state is because of the trauma and then uh there is bleeding and when the bleeding is uh because of this arterial bleeding there is no control on it and the uh, hematoma is increasing in size it causes a uh, effect on the consciousness again when it 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 becomes uh, a bit bigger and there is again a decrease in the loss of consciousness we call this gap between the two phases of unconsciousness as the lucid interval so a patient presenting to you with a lucid interval between uh, the two phases of unconsciousness uh, think about uh, extradural hematoma or the epidural hematoma other symptoms can be headache or nausea and vomiting okay now you can see this uh, picture uh, in this uh, what is this uh, um, presentation the clot is bright and it is biconvex because this dura it has elevated the dura is here this is the length or you can say this is the line of the dura and it has a well defined border because it is covered by the dural membrane it has a dura over it uh if a patient presents to you uh, to us with uh, this and uh, present to us with extradural hematoma and patient is uh, uh, having a lucid interval uh, you have to go for uh, urgent investigation ct scan is the investigation of choice for any uh, internal bra brain hemorrhage and uh, patient requires an urgent open craniotomy craniotomy or bar hole for evacuation of this clot and uh, 
because these vessels are difficult to be uh, managed as such if the uh, uh, if we keep it uh, uh, as such it may cause damage to the underlying brain tissue and there may be a permanent neurological deficit so as early as possible try to evacuate the clot and restore the homeostasis and uh, prevention of cerebral herniation can dramatically improve the outcome we are preventing the cerebral her herniation and uh, the cerebral herniation is uh, uh, protected and the outcome is better for these patients okay uh, one thing is this sub uh, subdural hematoma now look at this picture look at the shape of it this is the uh, biconvex shape you can see here spindle shape or biconvex shape now look at the shape of the subdural hematoma look at the shape of this subdural hematoma you can see here it is bounded by the dura on one side and the brain matter itself on the other side so it is more like a crescent or a hilal so these subdural they usually present as a hilal or a crescent shaped uh, um, pattern on ct scan these are ct scan finding but the subdural uh, the epidural hematoma they usually present as or if you see the ct scan they have a spindle shape this is a spindle shape or we call it uh, biconvex shaped uh, appearance okay now subdural hematoma is uh, bleeding between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater uh, and usually we have three varieties the acute presentation subacute presentation or the chronic presentation uh it usually presents with uh, venous bleeding as compared to the epidural hematoma usually there is a tearing of the bridging veins uh, we have discussed before that arachnoid plexus is full of uh, blood vessels full of the veins and uh, usually uh, there are bridging veins the brains that are bridging the uh, cranium and the uh, brain um, or uh, the these meninges uh, or the covering of the brain and tearing of these bridging vein can uh, result in subdural hemorrhage and uh, hematoma uh, it may be slow to develop sometime it is acute but it can be slow to develop so uh, there are that's why there are varied presentations sometimes there are acute sometimes there are subacute presentations or sometimes there are chronic presentations now i'll discuss the acute subdural hematoma if the hematoma appears within uh, 24 to 48 hours after the severe head trauma and uh, uh, it is called an acute subdural hemorrhage and it is because of the rapid acceleration deceleration injuries and clinical manifestations are the same as that of elevated intracranial pressure acha can you tell me what are the signs of the elevated intracranial pressure what is uh, uh, what are the signs of the elevated intracranial pressure signs of elevated intracranial pressure level 12 what are the signs of the elevated intracranial pressure headache vomiting febrile dematis okay yes headache uh, they may have uh, blurring of the vision uh, patient may have uh, vomiting vomiting also one of the uh, common symptom change in the behavior a person who is otherwise very talkative very uh, uh, social he becomes uh, calm and uh, uh, less talk talkative sometimes there may be a uh, uh, loss of consciousness also or lack of uh, uh, energy or uh, maybe problems in activities like uh, if a patient is uh, uh, not liking to get up or go uh, or walk so these patients after trauma they don't present earlier because these uh, hematomas they are slower to develop they are uh, gradually increasing and causing symptom so uh, uh, the elevated icp when it is elevated to a level that it causes pressure on the brain uh, patient presents with the symptoms the size of hematoma actually determines what is the clinical presentation Uh, this could be a decreasing loss of consciousness and, and the patient may be drowsy confused to unconsciousness state. so this whole spectrum can be seen depending on the size of the hematoma other can be headache 
ipsilateral pupil dilatation or a motor signs of um, motor signs of neurological deficit okay on head ct scan the clot is bright and uh, so mixed density it is not white as like in epidural hematoma and it is lunate um, the crescent shaped or lunate uh, in uh, appearance and uh, the border is not very distinct because there is associated uh, penetration into the um, uh, underlying brain matter okay again for the management of it uh, uh, if the patient is having symptoms, we'll discuss the uh, indications for uh, urgent uh, surgery or indications for expo uh, exploration, inshallah, in the next slides. But uh, just for this, if the patient is having an acute subdural hematoma and symptomatic, open craniotomy is advised and uh, we evacuate the clot. And uh, if uh, um, we have, uh, uh, sometimes we just do it by burr hole. We don't uh, do it in uh, craniotomy all the time. And sometimes if the things are massive, uh, we can go for craniectomy. Craniectomy means we take, uh, we remove a part of the brain uh, skull. We remove that part to maintain the things inside. So sometimes we go for craniotomy, open craniotomy, or sometimes burr hole or sometimes craniectomy. Uh, craniectomy means uh, removal of the skull, not the brain. Uh, you have to just uh, take um, uh, away the bone to release the compression there. Okay, uh, this decompression is indicated if uh, STH is more than one centimeter in thickness or smaller hematomas that are asymptomatic. So uh, the uh, CT scan size is very important for more than one centimeter thickness uh, STH uh, uh, with acute presentation, presentation within 24 to 48 hours, uh, open craniotomy is indicated. Now, subacute uh, 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 subdural hematomas, they occur within two to 14 days after injury. Uh, patient may have alteration in the mental status. And again, the progression depends on the size and location of the hematoma. What is the size uh, and location? Uh, uh, according to the location, we have the motor deficit or the logical sensory deficit. Chronic subdural hematoma, it takes uh, weeks or months after a minor head injury. It's usually minor head injuries, uh, uh, which were initially uh, uh, um, not uh, very uh, taken very seriously. Sometimes they, there are development of minor uh, subdural hematoma, then they develop over a period of weeks or months. And usually these are in adult, uh, sorry, old aged patients. And uh, the manifestation is uh, progressive loss of the uh, consciousness or progressive change in the status of consciousness. So uh, just to revise epidural and subdural hematomas, uh, epidural hematoma is biconvex. Uh, subdural hematoma is uh, bicon. Uh, sorry, it is uh, uh, crescent in shape or uh, lunar in shape. And uh, location: epidural is between the skull and the dura, while subdural is between the dura and the arachnoid. Uh, epidural is usually because of the um, uh, vessels, and most common involved vessel is the middle meningeal artery. And it could be because of uh, some sinuses, sinus uh, bleeding. And subdural is usually because of the bridging veins, the, the veins that bridge the cortex with the, uh, uh, these uh, meninges. Symptoms in epidural, there are usually a uh, lucid interval followed by unconsciousness. And in subdural, we have gradually increasing uh, symptoms. Patient um, initially having mild symptoms and with the passage of time, the symptoms are getting worse and worse. CT appearance, uh, biconvex appearance in uh, epidural and crescent-shaped appearance in the subdural hematoma. So the uh, clinical presentation of the patient can tell you even what is the type of the injury inside. So just uh, having seen a patient presenting to you with a head injury and uh, there is a lucid interval, think about epidural hematoma, but a patient who was initially fine and doing well, and then uh, within the passage, uh, uh, with the passage of days, patient is getting uh, confused or there are uh, sign and symptoms of neurological deficits, think about subdural hematoma. That may be more a chronic or a subacute variety. There is another uh, area of hemorrhage that is very important, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, in which the bleeding is between the arachnoid and the pia mater. And usually the cause of it is the body aneurysm. 
uh, the rupture of the Barry aneurysm. Can anyone tell me what is the Barry aneurysm? What is Barry's aneurysm or Barry aneurysm? You have read it in uh, your physiology also. And uh, 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 part of anatomy too. You have done it in anatomy. What is Barry's aneurysm? Anyone? Is it but, uh, rupture of the... No, what is Barry aneurysm? Rupture, to, uh, rupture causes uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. But what is uh, Barry aneurysm itself? What is its location? Do you know what are aneurysms? Do you know what are aneurysms? Aneurysms are dilatation of the veins or dilatation, oh, sorry, dilatation of the arteries or vessels. Uh, and there are of various varieties. Sometimes there are secular aneurysm that are in the form of a sac. And if um, uh, this sac is uh, cut or damaged, there is massive um, injury. Just like think about a berry. What is a berry? Berry is uh, uh, it's a fruit. It's like uh, uh, you can say hanging separately from its branch. There is a branch and then a berry is uh, hanging down. So just like that, an aneurysm that is hanging down from the uh, vessel uh, with minor trauma, with minor injury, they may get fracture or they may get uh, 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 damaged and patient get the symptoms of uh, 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 subarachnoid hemorrhage or uh, uh, subarachnoid uh, or we can say uh, there is a sudden um, uh, hemorrhage. Usually uh, these aneurysms, they are present in the subarachnoid plexus that are on the uh, um, lower aspect or the basilar area of the brain. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a very typical presentation. A headache, patient may complain of headache many times. Patients uh, usually presents uh, um, before the rupture, uh, complaining of headaches, sudden headaches, and uh, headaches are uncontrolled. But they are brief headaches, not prolonged. And uh, then they may present as an emergency case, loss of consciousness, severe headache, and loss of consciousness followed by it. So uh, clinical features are explosive headache. Patients may complain that it is the worst headache they have ever felt. Uh, associated symptoms can be nausea and vomiting, decreased loss of consciousness and coma, or there may be signs of meningeal irritation. Okay. Uh, if you see the CT scan, there may be uh, increased attenuation seen in the CSF spaces over the cerebral hemisphere. The attenuation is increased. And uh, treatment, if the patient presents to you with uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, the, the, the treatment is you have to manage the patient according to the presentation. What is the presentation you have to manage? It's usually they are not very common, they are rare, but uh, if present, you have, to be, uh, you have to treat it according to the cause. Okay, then we have intracerebral hemorrhage or intraaxial hemorrhage. The hemorrhage that is within the brain tissue. And uh, this can be a hemorrhage in the parenchyma of the brain or a hemorrhage into the ventricles of the brain. So it could be intraparenchymal hemorrhage or it could be intraventricular hemorrhage. Causes can be uh, hypertensive vasculopathy, uh, 70 to 80% of the time. It could be a ruptured aneurysm or uh, it can be because of trauma. Uh, you have read it in medicine also, uh, the hypertensive vasculopathies or uh, the problems in the uh, elderly people. 
and, and it's, it is one of the, uh, um, the that is uh, the major population that present with uh, hypertensive problems, hypertensive vasculopathy. But uh, younger population usually present with traumatic uh, injuries or traumatic uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhages. Clinical presentation is patient presents with rapidly progressive severe headache. Uh, building over several minutes, often accompanied by a focal neurological deficit because uh, no, the affected area of the brain that uh, the affected area of the brain uh, will show the neurological uh, signs. Uh, nausea and vomiting and uh, may be associated with a decreased level of consciousness. Now sign and symptom depends on the hemorrhage. Uh, whatever is the site of hemorrhage, the symptoms will be according to it. If it is basal ganglia or the internal capsule, patient may present with hemiparesis or dysphagia. If it is cerebellum, which is associated with the balance control, there will be ataxia or vertigo. If it is affecting the pons, the cranial nerve deficits will be uh, obvious or a patient may be having coma. Or if cerebral cortex is affected, patient may have hemiparesis affected uh, uh, the site of injury, uh, other opposite side of the side of the injury will be presented with the symptoms like hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, hemianopsia, and dysphagia of the other side, not the whole uh, body. Okay. How to uh, diagnose uh, intracranial uh, hemorrhages? In trauma, we go for the uh, gold standard is uh, CT scan. Uh, if we uh, ask about the investigation but just keep it in mind whenever it is asked what is the first step of uh, uh, diagnosis diagnosis what we usually mean is uh, investigation this is our common thinking but keep it in mind for all the mm, diseases history and examination are the guiding tools of diagnosis they are the first guiding tools if it is asked in any question or anywhere if someone asks you what is the first uh, thing you will go for or you will do to go for diagnosis your first thing should be i will take a proper history and a thorough examination i will take a uh, thing so how to take the history in head injury patient? If the patient is unconscious, you can ask the uh, person who is the uh, next to him or who is the attendant. Ask about the mechanism mechanism of injury. Ask about uh, the loss of consciousness. Patient unconscious and became conscious again. And uh, now again, he has presented with unconsciousness. You have to check for the lucid interval. Then evidence of scissors. If there is any neurological uh, uh, trigger point that is causing scissors uh, after the trauma. History of vomiting is very important. History of uh, rhinorrhea, otorrhea, um, all the signs of intracranial pressure, uh, raised intracranial pressure all, are also very important. Then pre-existing conditions, old age patient, especially in old age patient. What, are, what were the pre-existing medical conditions in that patient? Medications. If the patient is on anticoagulants, uh, the uh, chances of having hematomas or uh, expansion of hematomas are very common in um, patients uh, after trauma. Then patients taking illicit drugs, uh, illegal drugs, or alcohol. I have to take all these into account that can cause uh, more stupor. In physical examination, uh, we first go for a Glasgow Coma score. This is an emergency setting, so we are not going the uh, we are not taking the history in detail. But these things are important that you should record somewhere. And, and again, in physical examination, the first thing you will see is the uh, coma scale for that patient. How we check the Glasgow Coma score? Can anyone explain the GCS or the Glasgow Coma score? What is the Glasgow Coma score? For consciousness. Sorry. Glasgow For patient uh, consciousness. Uh -huh. How you assess? How you assess uh, this? And what are the things that we check in Glasgow Coma score? How we check the Glasgow Coma score? The Glasgow 
performance code, we take three things into account. The eye movement, the verbal response of the patient, and the motor response of the patient or the motor, uh, uh, the response of the patient to, the, our, to our motor commands. So for GCS, we have, the first thing is eye response. When you are in front of such a patient, you look for the patient, whether the patient is looking here and there with open eyes. If the patient is looking here and there with open eyes, we call it uh, glossocoma score four, sorry, E score four. This is the first uh, eye response. If the patient is not uh, awake or patient is not responding, but when you talk to the patient, patient opens up his eyes with pain or with other complaints, we call it E3. E3, when the patient is not uh, uh, opening eyes spontaneously, but patient is doing it when you are talking to the patient. Third is patient is not uh, opening the eyes even on your command, but when you give pain sensation, patient open his eyes. This is called E2. And if a patient doesn't open his eyes at all, we call it uh, E1. So we have four E's. Okay, I'll write it here. We have four in E. E1, spontaneous. E2, on speech. Stop it. Just a minute, I will. Okay, E4 is the maximum. Maximum is patient is spontaneously opening his eyes. You go near the patient, patient open, open his eyes and look at you. So if he is opening the eyes spontaneously, we call it E4. E3 is when the patient is not opening the eyes spontaneously, but he open it when you are speaking to the patient. When you give him a verbal command, open your eyes, please. When you say this, the patient responds to you and open his eyes, this is E3. E2 is patient is not responding on your verbal command even, but when you give pain sensation, when you uh, give some pain to the patient, um, you pinch some area of the body, patient opens his eyes uh, suddenly. And E1 is when the patient is not responding at all, there is no eye opening. This is E. Then we have, um, after E, we have verbal command. In verbal, again, we have uh, five Vs. We have V5, a normal speech. We have V4, which is a bit confused. Normal patient is oriented, but confused. What is V3? Patient is, uh, uh, what you can say, talking, but inappropriately. Uh, the words are inappropriate, like you are saying, how are you? And he's saying, I went to this area and that was very good. That but the patient is not oriented and give uh, um, unsensible or you can say okay, an, an, uh, inappropriate answer to your question. So inappropriate uh, words or uh, inappropriate uh, speech or sometimes a patient may not even uh, use uh, proper speech uh, when he's talking. So it is called inappropriate words or inappropriate speech. Uh, sometimes the injury is such a degree that patient, when you ask uh, from the patient, how are you? He just mumbled. He's just mumbling or he's uh, saying something that you cannot understand. He is just mumbling out. You cannot figure out what is he saying. This is called V2. And V1 is no response. So uh, unconscious patient is V1. He is not responding, so he is V1. Then we have motor. In motor, again, we have six uh, points. M6 is a patient who is normal in his uh, power and uh, normal in his um, movement. Uh, when you say the patient to raise hand, patient follows your command. This is M1, uh, this is M6. If you say the patient to raise hand, he does not raise hand. And when you give pain, 
patient localize your hands keep it in mind that uh, the patient who is not in his senses or is not fully alert uh, he may not follow your command so you have to uh, check for his response to your uh, stimulus if you ask the patient to raise hand he does not raise hand it is m6 sorry if he follows your command and he raises hand it is 6 if he does not follow your hand uh, your command but when you give pain sensation patient comes a patient uh, um, tries to hold your hand this is called m5 when he hold the uh, when he tries to uh, move his hand to the point of the pain you are giving him a pain sensation on the chest and he comes and uh, he um, holds your hand that is causing pain to him with his hand. This is called localization. This is M5. So M even M5 is not, uh, um, what you can say, uh, M5 is not 100% okay. M5 is localizing the pain. It is not uh, 100%. 100% is when you say the patient to raise hand or do anything, he's doing it. This is M6. Then M4. The patient is, instead of you are saying him to, uh, uh, you are giving him pain sensation, instead, instead of localizing, he takes his hand away, trying to make himself away from that place. So this is M3. This is M4. M3 is when you give pain sensation to the patient, patient acquires a fetal behavior, or we call it a full body flexion behavior. This is M3. M2 is when you give pain to the patient, the whole body of the patient extends. He is feeling pain, but his behavior to that pain is not localizing, not moving away, but the whole body is, uh, uh, is in an extensor position. This is M1. And if there is no response, whatever pain uh, sensation you are giving, uh, this is M1. So what can anyone tell me what is the GCS of a dead person? What is the GCS of a dead person? What is the GCS of a dead person? Anyone? Level 12, you are awake or uh, sleeping now? What is the GCS of a dead person? Look at this slide and tell me what is the GCS of a dead person, do you think? Look at this slide and tell me what is the GCS of a dead person? Abdullah Saleh. Abdullah Saleh, are you are you in the class? Abdullah Yasin. Abdullah Yasin, uh, your mic is not working. Open the mic and tell me what is the GCS of a dead person?
Okay, I will ask it again, inshallah, in the tutorial. You have to tell me what is the GCSO for that person. Abdullah Yasin, I will ask the same from you. If your mic is not working. Okay. Uh, after a good history and examination, uh, for you, uh, we are talking about the examination. The first thing in the examination we did was the checking the Glasgow Commerce School. That is the very first step of um, the examination. You have to assess the consciousness status of the patient. Then check for the pupil size and response. And then signs of skull fracture, the, th the things we uh, discussed in the beginning, patient is having raccoon eyes or battle sign, or there is something coming out of the ear or the nose. And then for motor deficit, check for the full neurological examination, check for the tone, check for the power, check for the sensations and check for the reflexes. So you have to do a complete physical, neurological phys physical examination of the patient also. Now, uh, your history and examination uh, of that patient can uh, lead you towards uh, some specific uh, 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 problem or the deficit, and then you can order the CT scan of the patient. CT scan is the best diagnostic tool, and uh, it uh, is the best to uh, uh, evaluate any uh, craniocerebral trauma. Uh, it gives a rapid diagnosis, and uh, at the same time, uh, we can go for uh, a computerized uh, uh, CT. Uh, guided intervention also, uh, like ventricular uh, uh, manipulations or other uh, um, evacuations. So uh, it is the best diagnostic uh, test. The NICE, uh, sorry, uh, the NICE guidelines, uh, they have uh, been published for it, uh, that when to carry a CT scan in a patient with head injury. And it says that if a patient is having a GCS of less than 13 at any point after trauma, if the patient is having a GCS uh, uh, below 13 uh, after the trauma, it's recommended to get a CT scan. Or if a patient is having a GCS 13 or 14 within two hours after trauma, or if there is a focal neurological deficit, if there is a suspected fracture that could be an open fracture, depressed fracture, or a basal skull fracture, because the periosteum is. Um, the periosteum that is covering the uh, uh, bones from the inner and outside both. The inner periosteum is uh, attached with the dura mater. The dura mater is attached with it and dura mater uh, attachment to uh, the periosteum is still the suture line. It is attached to the su suture line. At suture line, it is glued. In between, there is some potential space, but at the suture line, it is glued. So if there is any break in the skull, if there is any fracture, uh, minor structure, uh, minor fracture even, it will cause uh, blood to come and accumulate in the space that is between the periosteum and the dura mater, and it can lead to the epidural hemorrhage. So uh, you have to be uh, careful if there is a uh, skull fracture that is visible on the x-ray, um, go, for, uh, go for a CT scan. Then patient having any scissor activity after the injury, or uh, if patient is having more than one episode of vomiting. Uh, okay, these, these are for uh, do, uh, doing CT scan, but uh, even if none of these is present, but the patient is older, uh, oldest patient, or the patient is uh, on warfarin or has uh, some coagular pathies, or the mechanism of injury was very uh, dangerous. So uh, you have to uh, go for it. Or if the patient is having anti-grade amnesia. Uh, one is retrograde amnesia and one is anti-grade amnesia. Anti-grade amnesia means uh, retrograde is if he uh, forget the things that were uh, before uh, the injury. And anti-grade is after the injury. If he forget the things after uh, uh, that injury, we call it anti-grade amnesia. And if it is within 30 minutes, uh, 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 after 30 minutes of the injury, uh, if he's um, having a loss of memory of the events occurring afterwards, <coughs> go for a CT scan. Okay. Uh, if the lesion is small and in the brain, sometimes uh, MRI is preferred, but usually with the um, um, massive injuries and uh, with injuries of the skull, CT is more uh, uh, valuable and more uh, sensitive. Cervical spine x-ray is indicated if there is any associated cervical spine injury. 
and sometime um, uh, we go for transcranial Doppler uh, studies uh, to measure the cerebral blood flow also. Okay, how to manage the patients with severe head injury? Uh, these patients should be managed in neurointensive care settings and the ideal position of the patient while he is uh, in his bed, it should be uh, head up to 30 degree. Uh, it is important to ensure that cervical collar should be there, but it does not obstruct the venous return from the head. There should be uh, no compromise to the venous uh, return. So you have to be aware of it also. Now, uh, like any trauma, what is the first step of what is the first step of managing any trauma? What is the primary survey and resuscitation after trauma? What is the primary survey and resuscitation? Shalal Alatribi, are you in the class? I think half of the class is sleeping. Me too, sleeping. Shalal. Ahmed Yahya. Ahmed Yahya. Ali, Ali Al, Ali Al Dhaferi. Ali Al Dhaferi. Ibrahim Al Anizi, anyone in the class? Makki, can you tell me what is? Maki, can you open your mic? Yes, doctor. Okay. Can you tell me what is the uh, primary servant resuscitation for any trauma patient? What, uh, what, what is it, doctor? What is the primary servant resuscitation for a patient presenting to you with trauma? Uh, uh... Uh, ACP, airway, uh, breathing, and circulation, ABC, I mean. Yes, ABC and just ABC. And uh, oxygen, demand. And? The primary survey resuscitation means you will do A, B, C, D, E for the patient. A, B, C, D, E. We will have trauma lecture and we'll discuss it in detail tomorrow. What is A, B, C, D, E? Uh, check for the airway. Manage it. Airway and breathing and circulation and disability and exposure. Yes. And what is it? It is called primary survey and resuscitation because you have to take both the things together. You just not do it like you will complete A, B, C, D, E examination. You will check the airway, then you'll go for breathing, then you'll go for circulation, then you will go for uh, disability, and then you will go for uh, exposure, and then you will start managing. No, it is C for the problem and manage it. Do the primary survey and do the resuscitation at the same time. So what you will do, if you see a patient in trauma, even with the head injury, you will see the patient's airway, whether the patient is uh, having any problem in the airway, any uh, because it is a head trauma, so maybe there is associated facial trauma also. You have to look for it. If there is any associated facial trauma, open the patient's mouth and check for uh, any soiling or anything inside, any dentures, any foreign body, remove it out. And if the patient is okay and he's talking to you normally, means airway is patent. If airway is not patent, patient is having some uh, abnormal sounds coming out from his mouth, go for intubation. That could be through the or, uh, oral routes, the endotracheal intubation, or you can go for uh, other routes like tracheostomy uh, to supplement that area, or in emergency, we can go for cricothyroidotomy even. So the first thing is you will see the airway and you will manage it. If there is any problem, manage it. Go for, check the breathing. Patient is breathing normally or not. Both side of the air uh, lung has equal air entry, okay? If not, manage it at the spot. And uh, if it is not a life-threatening injury, 
continue with the rest of the thing and continue uh, and prepare managing it also. Third, check for the circulation. If there is any obvious bleeding, stop it, try to pack it, try to uh, put pressure on it. If you can control it, try to control it at the spot. If you cannot control it, plan for management. Arrange blood for the patient, give IV fluids to the patient at the same time when you are taking the IV fluids or you are making the IV line, take blood for investigations to check for the different uh, uh, blood chemistries as well as other investigations. And uh, blood for cross patching and grouping also because if there is massive trauma, patient may need uh, blood uh, transfusion. And then go for uh, D. What if D? D is the disability in which we check the GCS and we check the GCS and we check the uh, areas of disability. If patient is having any uh, local areas of uh, neurological deficit or local area of uh, motor deficit, you have to look for it. And then you have to check for the you have to cover, uh, you have to expose the patient to look for the other injuries as well as you have to uh, take care of the environment and provide patient uh, proper uh, temperature control so you just like any trauma head injuries also manage the same way the first thing is you will uh, take care of the airway you will check for the breathing you will check for the circulation and then you will check for the patient's conscious status and then you will manage it accordingly if the patient is having <coughs> stomach Can you see this screen here? Okay. okay, the first thing is uh, maintain the airway and ventilation. Uh, patient in traumatic coma is unable to uh, protect their airway. And the most pro uh, com common problem is the uh, tongue that may fall back and cause obstruction to the airway. So you have to maintain uh, um, uh, airway, uh, either uh, if the patient is breathing normally, you can place a giddel airway or uh, oropharyngeal airway. If the patient is not breathing uh, properly, then you may have to put the patient on ventilator and give ventilatory support to the patient. Then for circulation and cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, one very important thing is, uh, what is the, uh, uh, I will uh, give you a scenario, uh, listen to it and tell me what is happening there. A patient presents to you with head injury and when you monitor the blood pressure, patient's blood pressure is 160 systolic. The patient is a young, healthy adult male, but his blood pressure is 160 millimeter of mercury. And when you check the pulse, the pulse is low. It is around 70 to 60 uh, per minute. Uh, would you try to control this blood pressure? Are you getting my question? A patient who is having a head injury presents to you with a raised blood pressure and bradycardia would you like to control why the patient okay just tell me why the patient is having that increased blood pressure he does not have any history of it he does he is not an old age patient and there is no history of hypertension before so what is the cause of hypertension in this patient what is the cause of hypertension in this patient Any idea? This is physiology. This you have uh, you ha you have covered it in physiology also. Doctor, uh, sudden hypertension. Why? Why there is hypertension in this patient? why there is hypertension in a patient of head injury.
usually uh, when there is um, you know that uh, the blood is uh, sorry the brain has uh, a blood flow uh, that is called the uh, what you can cerebral blood flow the cerebral blood pressure cerebral blood pressure itself cbp okay and there is uh, also a water channel inside that is the csf okay so what is happening there is a balance between the two things there is a balance between the value of the csf and the value of the cerebral blood flow the cerebral blood pressure now when there is an injury the icp in uh, the intracranial pressure increases because of the pressure in the csf so icp is started to increase now, what is the body's response when the ICP will increase to maintain the balance within the brain? Uh, what will happen? The cerebral blood flow will start to decrease. But when the blood flow to the cerebral uh, arteries it decreases, it causes damage. It causes more problems. So what is the body's response? Body cannot control the ICP because ICP is because, uh, because of the trauma. So what body tries to do body increases the cerebr uh, overall arterial blood pressure to increase the cerebral blood flow. So usually what we see in the patients with head injury that uh, if there, are, there is an increased intracranial pressure that to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure, the CPP or the cerebral blood pressure, they try to increase the arterial pressure. So the arterial pressure is increased secondary to the increase in the intracranial pressure just to keep the CPP in uh, normal limits. Because if CPP is decreased, there will be very uh, urgent or very severe neurological deficit. So what is body doing? Um, just I will find that page again. So what we have here, we have cerebral perfusion pressure and this cerebral perfusion pressure is actually uh, the uh, what you can say the subtraction of the arterial blood pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So if the intracranial pressure is increasing to maintain the CPP, to maintain the center, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure, arterial blood pressure is also increased. And what is the patient presentation? Patient presents to us when we check the vitals, the BP is high and reflexly the uh, heart rate or uh, the uh, what you call it uh, there is bradycardia because the heart rate is reflexly decreased so if a patient is presenting to you that is a very common vital signs uh, deterioration in these patients that their arterial blood pressure is increased and if you see the pulse rate it is reduced it is common in the patients with head injury okay uh, now what you have to uh, uh, see in these patients, uh, hypotension. If there is hypotension, the, uh, the, uh, if the, there is a, uh, too much low systolic blood pressure, the outcome is worse because that is unable to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure inside the brain. So that is important for you to understand that CPP is, uh, should be maintained at a specific level. Okay, hypertension and hypoxia, they are a major cause of secondary brain injury. The initial brain injury was after trauma, but the secondary insult is because of the hypertension and hypoxia. A systolic blood pressure of less than 90 uh, has a worse outcome in traumatic coma. And uh, uh, to uh, keep it in uh, balance, the cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained at more than 65 millimeter of mercury in severely head injured patient. And a body tries to maintain it when you see the patient's blood pressure. If it is raised, it means it is compensating the raise, uh, rise in the intracranial pressure to keep the same level of the cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so we have already discussed that you should keep the bed, hand, uh, bed, bed head end up to 30 degree and uh, the venous drainage should be avoided uh, by even by this, uh, the spinal cord or the cervical collar that the patient has in place. Then if the patient is having uh, uh, scissors, give him, um, um, uh, if the patient is having some uh, problem of uh, motor control, give him sedation or muscle relaxant. Uh, his uh, CO2 level should be remained uh, within limits, should not be hyperventilating, it should not be uh, underventilating. 
uh, give diuretics to the patient. Uh, diuretics, the best diuretics here are the osmotic diuretics, the mannitol, but uh, frucimide sometimes is also used. Scissors control should be with the anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, temperature, uh, temperature of the patient should be controlled and barbiturates are added to control the inter, uh, intracranial pressure, increase in intracranial pressure. Medications that we use uh, here, they are the osmotic diuretics, anticonvulsants, barbiturates, and the calcium channel blockers. Osmotic diuretics, they are infused. Uh, and actually, the osmotic diuretics has no direct role in the management, but actually they are to give us time. They give us time to uh, prepare the patient for surgery. Uh, they keep the, uh, they are doing the diuresis uh, of, um, uh, to such an extent that the ICP is maintained for a period of time, but that is a brief time. You have to uh, prepare the patient in between that time for the surgery uh, to control the things. Anticonvulsants to uh, control the scissors. There are scissors of the, uh, um, because this is an activity in the motor cortex, phenytoin is advised and uh, it is given as 10 to, 10 to 15 mg per kg. And then there is a maintenance dose that we give about 100 mg uh, per oral, <coughs> six to eight hourly. Phenobarbital uh, is given as it uh, reduces, uh, it helps reduces the intracranial pressure and uh, surgical management is needed if the collection is more than 10 ml or if there are associated features or associated neurological deficits. Indication are the GCSS score decreased by two or more points between the time of injury and the hospital evaluation or the patient presents with fixed and dilated pupils or the intracranial pressure exceeds 20 millimeter of mercury. If the ICP is uh, normally it is around uh, 15 to uh, 20, if it is more than uh, it, if it is more, it, it, it is more than 20, then you have to uh, plan for uh, intervention. Uh, how we intervene? We can go with a bar hole. Uh, bar hole is making a hole into the cranium and try to evacuate the blood from that area. Usually the blood is in the clotted form, so we have to uh, suck, uh, suck it with the help of the suction device. We can go for craniotomy. Uh, we make four bar holes uh, in uh, area where we want to operate. And then we cut the bone uh, between those bar hole areas. And this is called a craniotomy. The whole flap is removed. But after the completion of the procedure, we put that flap back. This is called craniotomy. And another term is craniectomy in which we remove that part and we don't replace it back. This is craniectomy when you remove it. Okay, uh, we can go for cranioplasty if there is a um, comminuted fracture of, or if there is a deformity of the skull that needs to be uh, uh, repaired, you can go for a cranioplasty. We take bone graft from some other area or even bone from some, some other area and we can replace it there. Uh, nursing management of the patient post-operatively or uh, after the uh, trauma is very important. You have to look for the ABC. You have to check for the GCS. Continuous monitoring of the ABC and GCS. Uh, logical examination. Uh, keep an eye on the signs of elevated intracranial pressure and uh, the signs of CSF leakage, the autoria and rhin rhin rhinorrhea. And uh, the ineffective tissue perfusion related to interruption of the cerebral blood flow associated with cerebral hemorrhage and edema. It will be acute pain because of the trauma or cerebral edema. So if the uh, 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 patient is presenting to you with acute pain, you have to manage it. Hyperthermia can be because of increased metabolism and loss of cerebral integrity function, secondary to possible hypothalamic injury. So uh, you have to manage for that hyperthermia and patient should be remained normothermic as we have already discussed it before. Uh, Impaired physical mobility related to decrease of consciousness and treatment. Uh, patient is because patient is uh, prolonged on bed rest because of the loss of consciousness. So you have to take care of the uh, continuous uh, bed source, um, bed source monitoring, and uh, patient should be avoided triple bed. Uh, anxiety related to the abrupt change in the health status, hospital environment, and certain features uh, should be uh, discussed. And risk of complication related cerebral edema and hemorrhage. Uh, should be uh, uh, weighed out. Now, preventive measures uh, should be uh, by good education, by using of uh, safety measures like uh, helmets and uh, 
proper uh, seat belts uh, uh, seat belt use and uh, rehabilitation is uh, uh, advised uh, in certain cases if the patient is having a uh, continuous problem or patient is having uh, severe injury with uh, consequences or with uh, permanent damages uh, they should be uh, given care in some hospices or uh, at home and uh, they should be taken care about nutrition, bowel and bladder management because these can be affected, scissor disorders and uh, there should be uh, participation of the family and uh, its education to deal with this patient. So it's not only the urgent management, the rehabilitation is also important in the care of these patients. Okay, um, leave it. Now, uh, the important uh, uh, things here uh, in, in this, uh, uh, any patient with presenting to you with head injury is that you have to keep it in mind that it is a trauma. So the uh, focus of trauma is on the same. You have to look for, you have to treat the patient. You don't have to look for uh, just diagnosis. Diagnosis is side by side, you have to diagnose, but whatever is the patient's presentation, you have to treat that also. You have to look for the patient's uh, current condition because the patient has presented to you with trauma, but it may be having uh, some airway problem. It may be having some uh, breathing problem or uh, uh, problem in the uh, circulation because of the lo loss of blood. So you have to manage the thing side by side. Just don't uh, do for, go for diagnosis and sending the patient for CT scan or sending the patient for X-ray. Patient may collapse in between. You have to be aware that uh, you have to uh, uh, treat the patient side by side. It's not only just uh, investigating and diagnosing the patient. Okay, this is uh, all about head injury. Uh, anything you want to ask from it? Any question? Okay, uh, should I start the lecture or you want to break? You want a break? The other two lectures are small, they're not so big. I think Dr. will need a break, five minutes. Okay.